welcome to our event, My Life, My Business. Wish I was here. Okay, so what um, I was introducing was really a, a book that's entitled uh, The Enneagram at Work by Jim McPartland and Anna Agbury. This book is all about unlocking the power of type to lead and succeed. And obviously the type that they are referring to here is the Enneagram type. And it reveals how applying the Enneagram and emotional intelligence metric can elevate leadership in the modern place. And so we, we went through basic things like uh, how the Enneagram can help you capitalize on your strengths and, and check your weaknesses and also how to use the Enneagram to discover your true essence. And part of that is that we briefly introduced the types. And I'll, I just want to uh, recap that very quickly. Of the nine types that we've introduced, number one is referred to as the, the strict perfectionist. And the strict perfectionist has at its core motivation, have to do the right thing or the good thing. Number two is the considered helper and their motivation is to be liked and appreciated. Number three is the competitive achiever and their motivation is to outshine the rest. Type four is the intense creative and their motivation is to be unique and authentic. Type five is the quiet specialist and their motivation is to understand. Type six is the loyal skeptic and uh, their motivation is to be safe and to belong. Type seven is the enthusiastic visionary. They have to experience it all and sometimes and mostly to avoid pain. Type seven is the active controller. They have to be in control and to be strong. And then type nine is the adaptive peacemaker and they have a, a motivation to keep the balance. Um, they are known as peacemakers and harmony is of vital importance to them. And that is just the, the different types. So just a reminder that um, the Enneagram assessment tool really unpacks deep-seated core motivation and it, their types are not defined by their outwardly observable behavior and so it's it's something that we've spoken about often during our event is you know we observe behavior but we don't often appreciate the intent behind the behavior so don't be misled by just behavior and think you can type people accordingly so um just uh, a comment is that behavior is visible above the waterline when we consider the iceberg model but it is driven by deep unconscious motivations. And so um, without further ado, dealing with this book, we wanna go on to the, the next subtopic within the book. And it's basically to be an effective leader, you need to cultivate self-awareness. Now it's an overlap of, of last week because I touched on this, but we, we, we quickly ran out of time because we were having so much fun. But to be an effective leader, you need to cultivate self-awareness. So in the modern workplace, self-awareness is as critical as a technical competency. And research also shows that confidence and creativity come from seeing ourselves clearly, right? We build stronger relationships, we perform better and lead more effectively while in turn lead to more profitably profitable companies and so being self-aware means not allowing your patterns to function on autopilot and um, there are several aspects of of this is that you can focus your mind to become stronger through mindfulness exercises such as meditation and so forth you can also um, be curious and, and you can start each day with the aim of learning something and ending with a reflection on what you've learned during which you build personal growth into your daily routine. Um, you also um, honor your commitments. It's doing what you say you're going to do as the one part, right? And doing it because, you know, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then also knowing when to say 
No. It's always an interesting thing. You know, it's, it's got such negative con connotations. Saying no to somebody has such deep underlying, um, perhaps, um, consequences for the individual saying no. It's, you know, you, you, you kind of imagine that the, you imagine the worst. Um, and I think at the very heart of saying no to other people is um, seemingly rejecting others might mean you will be rejected, might mean um, you will be ostracized, might mean you lose out on an opportunity or you lose out on a relationship. So therefore, very difficult to say no. And yet every single text and uh, piece of research and study and uh, the next best guru handbook that we read, it all says is, is have the courage to say no to mm -hmm. some things. Don't say yes to things that you know you don't want to do and feel under compulsion and pressure to do them um, just to fit in. And I guess at the heart of it sits the core motivation. I want to fit in, I want to be like, I want to be accepted. Therefore, I will say yes to everything. You say yes to everything, chances are you're going to be failing on a lot of things, not meeting your commitments. And so it just feeds back into you, 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 you're, not what, you're not going to do what you say you're going to do. Your yes will eventually not mean yes. Um, so just to say, in order for you to always ensure that you do what you say you're going to do is that you need to know how to say no to those things that dilutes your focus, derails your commitment to achieve the objective or the goal or, the, or meet the expectation. Um, another aspect is, as a leader, as you need to choose your team carefully. And um, the key to understanding this is that you've got to know yourself a lot better. And that's why we talk about um, self-awareness. So once you understand yourself and how you work, you can bring together people who complement you, right? So you're not looking for many me's. You're looking for people who have different strengths in different areas. And, and rather than duplicating your strengths, it's literally just complementing your strengths filling in the gaps, being special in their own right. And so um, the more you know and understand about yourself, the more you don't turn a blind eye to your own shortcomings is focus on your strengths, understand what your shortcomings are and build your team around closing the gaps in your shortcomings. And finally, pay attention. Now, you know, it sounds like such a, a simple thing to say, but what they mean by that is, is that you need to practice to be present, right? And what does that actually mean, being present? Um, I'm not going to get deeply uh, philosophical on this topic, but basically where you are at physically is being aware of your surroundings, is knowing where you are. Um, and you know, the age old song, the one that I, I grew up with is, um, um, and it's a, a romantic song, but it speaks about um, your body being present with the person, but that your mind is on the other side of town. Um, and, and the singer or the lyricist wishes that they are present, that they are around, that they are there. You can see them, but where are they literally? And um, so basically is uh, take yourself and, and there are many things that affect being present and um, it's twofold really. It's, it's the things that we, we focus on that are uh, in our past. So we rerun the past, we rerun history. We, 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 we build a paradigm or a habit of thinking about the past and without us realizing, we also introduce into our current behavior um, the, um, the trauma of the past, all right? And we begin to see in anything that relates to past circumstances, we begin to um, anticipate the trauma of the past and we cannot enjoy the present, right? Because what we see as not what is right in front of us is what we see as history. Can't do anything about history, it's happened already. But we're either living in the past 
on the one hand and um, secondly um, we either living in the future you know on the one hand you're avoiding what happened as history on the other hand you expecting things to be better expecting that the future will be much better than where you're at um, at the classic case of not being present is is generally not enjoying where you're at not enjoying the of being present with people um, working with them, present with people, socializing, um, present with people, um, even in celebrations, not spending long enough time just celebrating the little goals and achievements that you're having, right? Celebrating every single step of little victories along the way. That's because you're already thinking about the next thing that you need to achieve. And I mean, how it manifests is, is how people often refer to this as like, you know, moving goalposts, you know, you scored the goal, but the goalposts have moved. There's not enough time to, to appreciate the goal. And um, so you never feel like you've won. And it's always, okay, don't pause long enough to appreciate what I have done right now. And always thinking about, okay, there's a gap, right? The things that I don't have, and you never appreciate the things that you do have. And what you do have in the present, they say, is the present, and that's your time, and that's the time that you have right before you. So the past, you can't do anything about. The future, you're hoping for, but you can't do anything about, in, in any case, is that you need to be present, and you need to practice to be present. There's breathing exercises, um, that that can be employed here and and the different ones and you know it's uh and there was a wide variety of these breathing exercises just thinking as some breathing exercises call it four four six for example or other people have different numbers associated with how long you hold your breath so basically um it is, it is how long, how many seconds you take to breathe in, and that's normally to the count of four, uh, how long you keep your breath uh, to the count of four again, and then breathing out to the count of six, and that's referred to as four, four, six. But as you're doing this, it's becoming aware of your breath going through your nostrils, into your lungs, holding and becoming more appreciative um, that way. So it is becoming aware of the breath that you're taking is, is one of the simplest presence uh, exercises. The other one is um, taking note of your surroundings, right? Is um, noticing what you can see. What is it that you can see? And, and then counting five things that you can see. And, and it's not just about what you can see, it's also what is noteworthy about the things that you can see. Four things that you that you can feel, right? Four things that you can feel, becoming aware of those things, um, literally. Um, three things um, that you you can um, that you can hear. Um, two things that you can smell, and one thing that you can taste. Just becoming aware of those things, right? Is taking your mind out of the past or out of the the future right, is literally practicing uh, being present. And um, so therefore, meditation exercises can certainly help you with this, is, is really um, consciously taking your mind out of the things that have happened. And yes, you, you have a vision for sure, and but you only have a vision to give you direction in your life. You've got to be energized in your life and everything that you do. So this is something that we teach is, is when we do um, mission uh, work, um, defining your mission statements, we say uh, it's very important to have a mission. It's that which energizes you every day, that which when you wake up in the morning and, and you need to do things, you understand the why of your activities and you are drawn to them and you're fully engaged with those activities. And so very, very important. So self-awareness is key as a leader, right? And deliberately preventing yourself to function on autopilot and um, then um, the book also focuses on balancing your three centers of intelligence to activate your core and to access your best self now what are these things and i'll use this time maybe to expand a little bit about that but the centers of intelligence that's being referred to here is that you have head intelligence and what is head intelligence is your 
it's where your logic comes from and you experience the world in a mindful way uh, it makes us observant and creative right then you have a body or a gut intel intelligence and through your body or gut this is how you take action and so therefore you rely on your instincts and when you do this makes us feel alive and grounded then you have a heart intelligence and this is where your emotion uh, is associated uh, with this and, and, and via this emotion, it makes us authentic and receptive. So therefore, for each one of us and, and, and you know, to live an integrated life, we got to balance both head, all head, body or gut and heart and understand that you have all these centers at work for you and not to overuse one at the expense of the other so balancing your centers of intelligence is the first step towards core activation and what is the core we're talking about the core type that you have whatever type it is that you find yourself as an enneagram type is is therefore to uh, operate consciously and access the best version of yourself as defined or as uh, highlighted by your type. And, and there's many things, many, many more things I can, I can really talk about where that is concerned, but I'm just now gonna summarize the rest of the book by, but without going too much into more depth. Um, there's another uh, chapter that focuses on being able to give and receive feedback and mentorship mentorship is a hallmark of great leadership so um, as one of the nine types there's a way we we respond to or react to for example criticism there's a way also uh, we we give uh, criticism there's a way we provide feedback in different contexts of course but um, generally speaking when we do uh, criticize, we're talking about providing constructive criticism. When we, in general, provide feedback, it is feedback on observable behavior, things that we see, things. And so in the way we clarify these things, very important to be able to understand your own type, you understand that, you're, that all types have virtues and vices. And therefore, within the virtue of your type, you want to connect uh, with the virtue of other types. But obviously, when we're operating in our blind spot, it's called a blind spot for a reason. We do not see what others can see. Right? It's oblivious to us. And therefore, with intuitive listening, the ability not just to engage with others, to um, to to just on, on the basis of what they are saying, but also um, it is to focus on also uh, on the nonverbal communication. And nonverbal communication is more than 80, 90% of how we communicate in any case, is to be very, very aware of that. And also we spoke about when you're being present, the ability to be self-reflective, that, that curiosity of learning, learning about yourself through the eyes of others, others is deals what, uh, with uh, deals with blind spots and so therefore uh, mentorship is really imparting, imparting your experience uh, so that someone else can learn from that and in order for them to achieve their goals and so um, being aware of your type and knowing how your type interacts and being aware of somebody else's type can certainly uh, help and make the interaction uh, engaging and constructive so yes um, leadership requires giving feedback all right um, it is it is um, always if you want to inspire and motivate yourself you need to you need to be able or able to give yourself feedback first and foremost but giving others feedback in terms of how they are uh, showing up uh, especially in here, we, we talk specifically about uh, dealing with others in a manner that's constructive and engaging if they're operating out of blind spot, also being fully aware you acting in your blind spot as well. Now, um, the other part uh, to um, really this book and, and making sure the, the, the Enneagram 
um, is working for you as a leader is to tap into humor, tap into your self-awareness and other Enneagram types to manage fear and failure. And, you know, there are so many different things that you could do here. I'm not going to expand into this, but um, when you take yourself less seriously, you can find the humor in any situation. You can, um, with humor, look at something, release the pressure build up and the stress. And when you can laugh about anything, and you know what they say, laughter is the best medicine, right? It's the best tonic to how you are feeling presently, how you how you ex how you are processing pressure. So if you can um, tap into humor, and 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 see the funny side to life, see the the, the funny side to how um, a team engages, how an organization engages. Um, it, it releases the kind of creativity that you need for engagement with people, to inspire people, to motivate them. And um, because this, this book is about uh, the Enneagram at work, is understanding the types, uh, the Enneagram types of the people that you work with, understanding um, and, and, and basically um, being able to um, not just use your intuition and um, the perceptions of how you're experiencing somebody else, but really educating yourself to, to kind of go, okay, it's not compartmentalizing or boxing anybody in, but it really just gives uh, language to use when you observe behavior because observe behavior is not good enough as we're talking about by knowing the Enneagram type, you begin to understand the motivation behind the behavior. So when you begin to understand the motivation behind the um, behavior, you can manage fear and failure, all right? Um, to a large degree, you're able to understand that your core, if your core motivation is um, your FOMO, the fear of missing out, for example, the fear of missing out, uh, adventure, the fear of experiencing an, an, a novelty or any of those kinds of things is to, is to understand that the antidote to, to this fear of missing out is to realize that not every experience need to be pursued, that sometimes the antidote to um, experiencing new things is to be able to be quiet and to withdraw and to appreciate, in it, and I suppose in itself, as this gratitude is, is to sit and reflect and rerun an experience. And being present is, 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 is to allow the exhilaration of a past experience to influence how you're experiencing your day. And it's not a relentless pursuit of something new. And so, um, Lastly, um, understanding your, your patterns, understanding the patterns of the other types is, um, um, brings you to diffusing conflict and you foster collaboration. And, and therefore, it gives you the tools in order to do so, right? It's not like, you know, when, when, when you're having uh, moments of conflict when you you don't know how to address it is that when you understand the motivations of the people around you 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 far more intelligent in terms of um, uh, engaging with those uh, meaning you now if 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 you are a, a person whose um, center of intelligence is always action, which means um, you, um, your, 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 your gut, your intuition tells you to do something, you just do it. Uh, and and you, you get things done this way, as sometimes just to understand that, hang on, I'm dealing with somebody whose um, center of expression uh, and therefore uh, the intelligence center is um, 
more in the thinking center position, more sort of considerate, more rational, and more analytical, more withdrawn, more reserved in their style. As, as, as to embrace it, we can all do this as long as we consciously want to do that. So, so basically, by understanding our types and our patterns, um, not only can we diffuse conflict, but it, it allows us to tap into the different strengths and uh, potential that everybody else holds around us to walk together on a journey of collaboration. So um, that uh, is, is really what I am going to share today. And that concludes the, the book, uh, The Enneagram at Work. And I'm just going to allow, uh, maybe have a brief uh, feedback from Julia and Melissa before we say goodbye to you. So what stood out for me is the fact that being able to be self-aware enables you um, to sort of like be able to cater to your own needs and be able to cater to other people's needs. And that mm. also sort of sends a message of how other people can cater to your needs, mm. you know, and that's how... Um, the team becomes sort of like effective. So that's mm. what's out for me. Okay. All right. Thanks, Julia, for that. And uh, anyway, thank you uh, for Julia and Melissa being here. That is our installment of My Life, My Business. Wish I was here. And it's always about living a life, you know, present and intent. And um, when you're listening and, and you you're quite welcome to listen this uh, listen to this either playback which you when you hear my voice you can do so or you know uh the edited version on our um, mufasa coaching practice uh youtube channel so without further ado we will check in with you next time again until next time bye for now bye